Hi everyone, welcome to this webinar on um, the key programs with implications uh, for support for children with behaviour that challenges. Uh, my name is Amanda Allard, I'm one of the assistant directors from the Council for Disabled Children and I'm here with Jackie Sherlock who is the Early Intervention Project Manager from the Challenging Behaviour Foundation. So we really want to start off by telling you a little bit about our organisations and then run through some of the key programs um, of work that could have significant implications for this group of children young people so that's children uh, with behavior that challenges um, I think this webinar is actually really timely because um, for unfortunately the wrong kind of reasons this group of children have just shot up uh, the government priority list at the moment so we've had uh, Connor Sparrowhawk um, the, the death of Cor Connor Sparrowhawk um, in a bath in an ATU um, and also young man uh, Matthew who um, who was not a, where they couldn't find him an appropriate place in an ATU, and and he's now been um, he's now finally been found a place in an ATU where they do have autism specialism. But actually, this means that we've we've had ministerial meetings, and there is a significant amount of interest about around this group of children, young people, and how we actually manage to support them better going forward. So that's why we're here, and hopefully that's why you're here as well. Um, so I'll just get Jackie to say hello. Hello, I'm Jackie Sherlock. Okay, and if Jackie, if you could go on to the next slide for me. Oh, we're having some technical problems already, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, well, I'll talk you through the next slide without you being able to see it, because um, it's not very complicated. So. Um, oh yes, and Luke has just reminded me um, that I, what, I sh what I should have also said is that obviously you can ask questions at any time during the presentation. Um, we may or may not be in a position to answer them while, while we're speaking. Um, and um, uh, but you need to type your questions in. That means that we've got a record of all of the questions, um, and if we can't answer them. Um, during the session, then we can get back to you um, to after the session. Okay, I think I've now told you everything I was supposed to tell you. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about the Council for Disabled Children for those of you who don't know about us. Um, we are the strategic reform partner for the Department for Education. That means that we've worked very closely with them on the implementation of the SEND reforms um, that were part of the Children and Families Act. Um, we are um, part of, uh, with the National Children's Bureau, the Department of Health strategic partner, which is, um, and this webinar is, is part of the series of work that we do under that banner. Um, and young people are very much at the centre of what we do, so we try and make sure that wherever possible, children's voice is central. Um, and we have been supporting for the last uh, three years a group of young people who have been advising the DfE around the reforms. Um, so that's kind of what I want to say. And, and if, I, if I hand over to Jackie and just say before I do so, that one of the reasons, I mean, we've always been very exercised about this group of young people because we think that there are very significant safeguarding challenges um, that have failed to be addressed and we also think that that they are they are not um, experiencing the life chances and opportunities that they should have and that's one of the reasons we're really delighted to be partnering Challenging Behaviour Foundation and a piece of work around this which Jackie will say much more about. Hello, my name is Jackie Sherlock. I'm the project manager of the Early Intervention Project, um, which is a joint project run by the Challenging Behaviour Foundation and the Council for Disabled Children. Um, for those of you who don't know anything about the Challenging Behaviour Foundation, it's a small national charity which provides family support to families of people with severe learning disabilities and behaviours described as challenging. And as Amanda said, along with the Council for Disabled Children, we identified the fact there was a real lack of focus um, of children with learning disabilities and behaviours that challenge. And what we mean by behaviours that challenge is behaviour that puts children, young people, people or those around them at risk, so that might be aggressive or destructive behaviour, self-injury um, or other behaviours that pose risks such as running away. Um, and we do know that there's really good evidence now of what works in supporting this group of children and that if you put those things in place early, um, that can make a really big difference. 
Um, the next slide sets out some of the evidence around that um, and Amanda and I have worked with others through um, the past few years to pull some of this together. Um, we know that many children sort of go through the period of the terrible twos um, where they um, may exhibit behaviours that challenge those around them, but for children with learning disabilities they're at much, much greater risk of this all through their lives because most children develop the social and communication skills that enable them to get their needs met as they grow older. Um, for many children with learning disabilities or autism, the additional barriers they face in communication and social skills make it much more difficult to get their needs met. So whatever the cause of their behaviour, it can often be used as a way to try and communicate whatever it is that they're experiencing. Um, and as the final box on this slide says, there is some strong evidence that the key factors causing and maintaining challenging behaviour can be changed. Um, and that's something that the programmes that we'll talk about um, as we go through the slides give us an opportunity to do. Unfortunately, um, many families of children with learning disabilities whose behaviours challenge um, have gone down what we've really called the well-trodden path, um, a real lack of local support, especially evidence-based support that meets their needs, um, which unsurprisingly um, leads to stress, emotional difficulties, and particularly where children experience things such as exclusion from school can make life very, very difficult to live. Um, the result of those sorts of situations is that many children end up a long way from home um, or in restricted um, settings, uh, particularly as they move into adulthood. Um, and we think that the programs that are, that, are, um, that are going forward now give us a real opportunity to support children down a route to improved outcomes. Um, so actually looking at what's causing their behaviours, assessing the reasons for that and providing a positive behaviour support approach um, and doing that locally um, so that people can experience a normal life in their communities. Okay, uh, it's back to me. I just wanted to um, run through very briefly um, sort of to remind you about the children and families. Like last time we, we did a webinar uh, as part of the DH Strategic Partner Programme, we, we covered the Children and Families Act in quite some depth. Um, and I will also show you a slide at the end where you can go for more information. So this is just kind of to remind you about the Act and to remind you really that it provides a possible framework for this, well, for, for all children, young people, but but for this group of children and young people for pulling the other programs that we'll mention together. So, um, the Children and Families Act, um, its aims for local authorities and health commissioners to work together more closely um, so that they can deliver better outcomes for children and young people with special educational needs and disability. Um, we need it because the previous system did not always work as well as it should, um, but it's not um, a blank slate. We are building on what has, um, what has worked uh, well before and trying to change what hasn't. Um, but I think fundamental to the Act is that importance of a shared vision across education, health and social care. Um, so what some of the key elements that are a really significant change are the importance of the voice of children, young people and their families. Um, and post 16, of course, um, the, the voice of children becomes, you know, has, has, providing they have mental capacity has the greater sway in terms of what should happen for them over and above that of their parents. So also a focus on outcomes. So before, in terms of service delivery, we've often been very focused on what we're going to deliver for young people without thinking sufficiently about whether or not that improves their outcomes and what it delivers for them in terms of their of their life and what they want out of their life. There's a real focus on joint working between local authorities, health and social care um, and integrating services to promote well-being and that really comes from that idea about you know families not caring where services come from, not caring who pays for them, just wanting the services to be wrapped around their child um, and also um, you know not wanting to have to tell their story you know to, to 10 different service providers but just having to tell it once and then that resulting in a holistic package of care. Other key difference 
differences are that it, it goes up to 25. So you um, you can be eligible for an education health and care plan up to the age of 25. And the reforms across the piece are looking at this group of children up until they are 25 years old. And it is importantly, SEN and disability. So whilst some of the focus is around, a lot of the focus around the education health and care plan is around whether or not young people and children, young people have a special educational need, um, it does also cover disability. So on to the next slide, joint commissioning arrangements. So, and I think just to sort of put this back in the context of children with challenging behaviour, you know, one of the things that we have really been talking to commissioners about when we've been talking about the Children and Family Act reforms is reminding them that actually, you know, they can make a real difference. In terms of early intervention, what's often missing for children with challenging behaviour is the health um, aspect of it. So, you you know, in terms of what Jackie was saying about the well-trodden path, you get a child or young person where the family um, is unable to keep them at home any longer because they're not getting um, any, they're not getting psychological support, they're not getting the support, kind of support that they need to enable them to manage their child's behaviour and, and to enable their community schools to manage that behaviour. So, they then will often go into a residential special school now, very often, that placement can, is, is wholly funded by the local authority, not across the board, but very often that's the case. And one of the things we've been talking to health commissioners about is actually, can you invest to save? If you think about those young people who then will come out of residential special school, will then be divorced from their local communities um, and are therefore much more likely to go into expensive, high-cost adult um, care placements, very often um, those, those, the funding for those placements may be coming out, out of a CCG's budget. So actually thinking about whether or not you could be doing more as a health commissioner to, um, to, to, to look at a preventative program um, and, um, and then you know, just starting earlier on, not waiting um, and, and paying for that high cost care later on. So that's one of the things that we've been talking about in terms of joint commissioning arrangements. So um, what, what do they cover? <clears throat> so um, under the Children and Families Act, um, what, what the joint commissioning arrangements cover is the EHC provision that's needed by children have, that has to be agreed what will be commissioned and by whom. Processes for improved identification and information sharing across services and a process for agreeing the health content in the EHC plan. So once the health content in the EHC plan has been agreed, then CCGs have a duty to provide what is put in there. But um, local authority can't go ahead and just you know, write whatever they want in the plan. It has to be agreed and therefore there needs to be a process for doing so. So, um, education, health and care plans, key principles. Um, so, they replace statements of SEN, as I've said, they can go up to, uh, to 25 if a young person still has an educational need up until that age. Um, any professional can request that a local authority carries out an EHC assessment. The, and the eligibility is based on educational need. So, you are not, um, so if you are disabled rather than a young person with a special educational need, you would get an education, health and care plan if the level of your disability was such that it was having an impact on your education. Um, so, health commissioners, providers and clinicians all have an important role to play in the HC process. So, moving on. Um, so, EHC assessments and plans, and this is one of the key differences again, must be person-centred and coordinated. And we have seen some plans which, which aren't, let's be honest about that. So, we have seen plans that, that say that a young person's aspiration is to make a good transition into secondary school. Now, we don't know many young people who talk like that um, and, um, and for whom that would be their aspiration. Um, so, you know, so there, there is still some work to do with local areas around them understanding what, what being person-centred really means and making sure that actually the plan starts and finishes with that young person's um, aspirations. So it's, it must have aspirations, it must set out some shorter term outcomes as well and then the provision that should help that young person to meet um, those goals. But it comes from the young person and their, and their aspirations first. So um, the EHC plan must specify the provision across um, education, health and care that, 
that has to be provided. Um, and the local authority must seek advice on all aspects of a child's health and development from the health service. So, and as I said before, CCG must ensure that commission services um, are, are mobilised to participate in the development of EHC plans. And the other important fact as well is that if you have um, an EHC plan, then you are entitled, should you want one, to a personal budget. Okay. Um, and that's your EHC plan checklist. So that's all of the different sections that should be in the plan. On to the next slide. Um, so this is just, um, partly I wanted to show you this, not because I'm going to talk through it in any detail, but just this is one of the, the um, resources that is, um, is, is part of our e-learning modules, which I referred to earlier on, and where you can go um, for, for, for a lot more information. There's also tons of information um, on, on the CDC website around the Children and Families Act if you are looking for more detail. But this just takes you through the 20-week timeline for the um, EHC planning process. Okay, so you've also got the local offer, <clears throat> so sets, which should be setting out what education, health and care services are available locally, um, should be developed by local authorities in partnership with children and people and their families, and then should be reviewed. So there should be a process whereby children and young people are asked for their opinions. You know, it's not just about involving them in the development, but then in the review as well. And there are some areas that have done some quite interesting things, actually, where, for instance, um, because obviously, f for the most part, um, people are accessing um, their local offer through the website. Actually, what some people have done is developed a system whereby if people are searching for things, on the local offer, the local authority get informed about that if um, if, if they're coming up with um, with a nil return on that search. So that actually, a local authority can build up a picture of what services people might be seeking, which they're not actually finding within the local offer. Health partners must cooperate to ensure services are reflected within their local offer. That's one of the things we've been talking to CCGs about, is about how you make sure that happens, how you work with local providers to make sure that they understand that, that what they can offer is also written up um, and maybe have that with, within you know contract requirements because obviously it's, it's another piece, you know, it is a significant piece of work for providers and they haven't had to do it before. Um, so, it, but it is an important tool to improve provision. And if you're doing that kind of thing that I was talking about earlier, where you know you're you're trying to assess what isn't available for families that they might be looking for, then that really can be giving you feedback about that can help you uh, can help inform future commissioning decisions. So, uh, just briefly to finish this bit of the presentation, just to sort of go through what's happening at the moment. Um, as those of you who have been working in this sector for um, more than a year will know, there was a real kind of race to the finish line in terms of the implementation of the Children and Families Act. The code of practice was out only uh, days ahead of, of implementation. And for the first year, probably, what people were very focused on was, you know, what you might term the operational aspect. So the things that people can, uh, you know, can, can see. So things like the EHC plan 20-week process, you know, was the health advice being provided within six weeks? Were the plans getting out within 20 weeks? Um, was there a local offer? And actually, what needs to underpin all of those is joint commissioning. And if you haven't got joint commissioning arrangements fully in place, then what you are doing is 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 basically you're approaching what should be a joined up process in a siloed way and actually what that does is it creates more work and in many cases when we've been going out to local areas what we've been finding is that actually you know people are managing to deliver because they're working incredibly hard and they're doing it on top of what they were doing and actually if local areas are able to take a step back and and do that um, do that integrated working and looking at things across the piece, then there is a real opportunity for them to work smarter and differently as opposed to just harder. Um, so, and that was just the, the thing that I mentioned earlier. So these are our e-learning modules around the Children and Families Act. They are um, aimed at the, primarily at health commissioners. There's a lot more information on the Council for Disabled Oh, and apparently the link to that is in the chat. Um, thank you, Luke. Um, so, uh, so yes, so those are our resources. So just wanted to make sure that you knew that if you felt that I'd skated over some of that detail, that there was plenty of opportunity for you to, to go and find out more if you want to. So 
So back to what we were saying at the be very beginning. So Children and Families Act is only part of this the, a, a big picture of initiatives, but it can, I think, provide the coat hanger, if you like, for helping to structure them together. Um, and I suppose what we feel, and one of the reasons we're sat here, is that there is a lot of activity, as Jackie says, there's a lot of programs that have the potential to improve outcomes and to improve the lives of this group of children, young people. And we think if people were thinking harder about how to join them up, then actually we could make sure that they, the whole was more than the sum of the parts. And that to some extent that isn't happening. And, and the more people who are thinking about the fact that it should be happening and pushing and asking local areas how they're doing things the more likely that is to take place. So just wanted to kind of talk very briefly through some of those overlapping strategies for improvement, which we will come on to some of them in more detail. So we have got Children and Families Act commitment in the NHS mandate. We've got the Care Act, and, and that, sh that with that requirement that, that the... Um, that there is better looking at transition and uh, moving a seamless transition into into adult life. Um, we're going to be talking about the Transforming Care Programme, the IPC Programme, Future in Mind. We won't touch on the Vanguard sites. We will touch very briefly on Children's Continuing Care Framework. Now, all of those, um, as we'll go on to say, have possibly significant implications for this group of young people if people are thinking about them in the right way. Um, and just to also mention the innovations and sustainability plans um, which each CCG um, has has had to produce um, and also helpful to think about you know because they are very focused on personalization and integration um, and really helpful to think about whether local areas have actually um, thought through how children feature in those because we know that too often uh, children are a little bit of an afterthought. So, the Transforming Care Programme. Um, some of you may recognise the picture in the corner of this slide, which is of um, Winterbourne View, and the Panorama Programme on Channel 4, which uncovered the horrific abuse of people with learning disabilities in Winterbourne View. Following um, uh, that programme, um, there has been a lot of work nationally around um, what needs to happen to improve support for people with learning disabilities and behaviours that challenge. Um, and um, the Transforming Care programme is led by NHS England um, with a number of partners. And NHS England has stated that improving care for people with learning disabilities is one of their top priorities. Um, there were six fast track areas chosen nationally to form transforming care partnerships and these are commissioning collaborations across um, clinical commissioning groups, local authorities and NHS England specialised commissioning. Um, these six areas submitted transformation plans which helped to shape a national strategy. Um, that strategy was published on October 2015 and it's called Building the Right Support. Uh, you can access the link to that um, and it includes a new service model but it's probably fair to say that much of the work that has gone on to date has been more focused on adult services particularly because there are greater numbers of adults in assessment and treatment units um, but the whole service model um, should be applicable across the age range and the service model itself contains a commitment to better early intervention and support for children. NHS England um, have allocated some funding for this work um, and it should be something, as Amanda says, that anybody who's working with children with learning disabilities and behaviours that challenge should be aware of and inputting to. Um, so the programme is led by NHS England in partnership with ADAS and the Local Government Association. Um, as I said before, the whole thing should apply to children, but there is a specific CAMS and Learning Disability strand of work um, which aims to pre prevent unnecessary admission to hospital for children, but also to identify better pathways um, for children and young people to prevent that admission um, and to ensure that people, um, particularly children and young people who've been at 52-week schools, have a good transition to adulthood um, with an education, health and care plan that supports that transition. 
Um, there are five regional posts in place to support this work um, and the NHS England Transforming Care website should be able to give you more information about how to contact those people in your area. Um, as I said, there's a particular focus on 52-week residential school leavers um, and all of those young people should have a person-centred education and health and care plan um, as well as um, those going into hospital having a care and treatment review. These are new reviews that have been brought in by the programme. Um, they started out as a review for those who are in hospital, um, in assessment and treatment units, to determine um, where they need to be um, and uh, look at a plan for um, uh, them resettling back in the community. Um, but there's now a commitment to take forward care and treatment reviews before admission because in many cases, doing that review with all the right people present can actually prevent admission. There are now um, transforming care partnerships in all areas of the country. Um, there are 48, so they're fairly large um, and, as I said, cover CCGs, local authorities and specialised commissioning. Um, and the NHS England website can um, give you the contact for, for who um, each transforming care partnership is led by in the particular areas. They're currently developing plans and those plans should include how they'll implement transforming care for children and young people um, and uh, there's a, a lot of focus on the moment about how um, how local areas can support children and young people better and as Amanda said I think a key vehicle for that um, is the Children and Families Act because if if all the provisions in the Children and Families Act and in um, the, the SEN code are being fulfilled properly for this group of children then actually local areas would be delivering the, the transforming care commitments for children and young people but we know that it is a group that's been historically failed by services so it's really really important um, that we have a collective focus now on how to get local support right for this group of children. Um, there is a grants program um, as part of the work, so £600,000 has been awarded to a number of voluntary and public sector organisations. Um, it's a fairly short scale um, in time-wise program, um, but to try and focus on some of the key issues and there'll be a number of reports um, available in the next few weeks. Um, some of this is around training for parents, um, some of it's around information and better guidance for commissioners and professionals and again there's the link for, for further information. Another area of work that's um, being led by NHS England, um, which is potentially really important to this group of children and young people, is integrated personal commissioning. Um, and for people who don't naturally fit into the services that are available as children with learning disabilities whose behaviours challenge often don't, I think this again could be really, really fundamental in actually improving everyday life and outcomes. Um, the aims of integrated personal commissioning um, are to prevent crises, to make sure that people have a, a better quality of life and to better integrate the care and support that they get. Um, there are a number of demonstrator sites across the country um, and they're focusing on particular groups in terms of those who they provide integrated personal commissioning for. And you can see that there are three or four with a particular focus on children with learning disabilities. The really important thing um, in terms of the integrated personal commissioning is that it is properly person-centred in the first place so that it starts with a proper understanding of a child or young person's need and then properly integrated conversation about how that's provided with the control of the resources um, managed by the family and those supporting them um, rather than children and families having to slot into different bits of services available um, or different organisations fighting over the other one funding that child or, or support for their family. Um, this is the Emerging Integrating Personal Commissioning framework. Um, as I said, it really starts with that person-centred approach actually being delivered in practice, um, meaning then that the person has control and has the support that they need, um, leading to fewer crises, or where there are crises, having a, a plan response to those. 
Okay, it's back to me again. Um, I just really wanted to talk about the, the National Framework for Children and Young People's Continuing Care. Now, some of you may be aware that this um, has just been updated um, and was reissued um, at the start of March. Um, and I think the reason why it's so important for this group is because traditionally um, looking for a child with behaviour that challenges with a children's continuing care plan has been looking like looking for hen's teeth. Um, and 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 the the level of care that they require um, hasn't really been um, identified or addressed through this process. Now, what the um, the revised guidance does, um, as well as locating the children's continuing process very clearly within the framework of the Children and Families Act and, and providing some high level advice on how you might achieve that within the overall 20 week process, is it does draw much more significant attention to the need to, to consider children with challenging behaviour for continuing care. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier on about making sure that we are looking at how we can best meet children's needs within the community um, without um, requiring that they, they have to go um, far from home in order to get their, their needs met. So um, I think that was really why we just wanted to make sure that people were aware of the guidance um, and, um, and, you know, draw their attention to it. So that's the children's continuing care framework. And we'll also make sure that we send a link to the new guidance because um, uh, we have some concerns about um, how effectively it's been disseminated at the moment. Um, so um, that's children's continuing care. Jackie, can you move me on? Thank you. So going on to future in mind, so this was um, the uh, coalition government's uh, review of CAM services uh, for all children um, and um, uh, the re review came out with a report which contained 49 proposals to transform the design and delivery um, of a local offer of services for children and young people with mental health needs and I think that that really identifies the the, the the paucity of services currently and the state which they had gotten to uh, before the review. So there were five key themes, promoting resilience, prevention and early intervention, improving access to effective support and a system without tiers. So we're very used to thinking about, um, the, you know, the, the four um, CAMS tiers and actually, you know, moving away from thinking about services, just like with the Children and Families Act, moving away from thinking about outputs and provisions, so actually thinking about needs um, and, and what a child or young person needs. Care for the most vulnerable, accountability and transparency, and developing the workforce. So participation and collaboration has been identified as a core principle um, with services, you know, services should be designed with children, young people and families if they are to meet their needs. So, um, local transformation plans. Each local area um, has was tasked and has produced a local transformation plan. Um, they were supposed to be produced collaboratively um, and they needed to outline how um, access and services for children and young people um, can and would be uh, improved locally. So, emphasis on local partnering and joint commissioning, again joint commissioning, um, and they have all been published. So, um, NHS England and the Department of Health are working with partners to jointly produce national guidance to support local areas to develop these plans and coordinate the activity required. So, NHS England aims to publish that guidance in July. Okay, <clears throat> so recommendations for SND. So obviously the future in mind and, and the entirety of the recommendations were for all children. But in terms of SCND, strengthening the link between children's mental health and learning disability services and services for children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities. So we know that traditionally there has been a real gap um, that young people have been falling between. So um, there has been an idea that talking therapies um, aren't suitable for children and young people with learning disabilities um, and some um, for some CAM services they've actually had an IQ um, requirement under which um, they would not meet a young person's needs. So and there is a, a real dearth of, um, of targeted and specialist support for children and young people who do have learning disabilities and behaviour that challenges. 
So um, recommend, the other recommendations for SEND to include appropriate mental health and behavioural assessment in admission gateways for inpatient care for children and young people with learning disabilities and all challenging behaviour and commissioners and providers working across education, health and social care and youth justice sectors to work together to develop appropriate and bespoke care pathways. So, you know, a much better vision for um, an integrated service for these children and young people, which include CAM services. So, local area transformation plans, plans should, oh, there's a word missing there, never mind, um, should include, I think, children and people who have a particular vulnerability to mental health problems and we know that with the group of children and young people that we're talking about particularly children possibly with autism um, who may have um, underlying high levels of anxiety that actually they you know they can have moments of crisis um, where they where CAM support would really turn things around for them and where they're not getting that actually that, that then that's leading to deterioration and, and a situation where suddenly behavior that was manageable becomes unmanageable just because of a lack of support and a lack of, of appreciation about what their needs are and, the, and how to meet them. Um, so, um, lo each local transformation plan should be publicly available on the CCG website. So, they're all up there now. Um, I think they've been up since February, that was the requirement, but they're certainly there now. Um, and I think one of the things that we'd like people to think, you know, is have a look at your local area plan if, if you're working in a local area um, and, and see what it says about children and young people with learning disability. Certainly from a, a, a kind of quick canter through some of them ourselves, you know, we've discovered that some of them are very cursory around learning disability. Some of them, you know, really do um, fully take into account, you know, what an integrated service that includes children and people with learning disabilities might look like, um, but, you know, but, but not enough. And then it's about, you know, who is accountable? You know, what happens when, and, and, and who, you know, what do we do when we know that, that, that the services that should be available aren't available locally? Who's accountable for that? And I think there, there is some unwrapping that needs to happen around that because I think at the moment, you know, we all know that there are areas where services um, and provision is very poor and there isn't sufficient understanding about what we do about that and how we move things forward and how we bring that up with CCGs. Um, and and how we ensure that progress and performance is monitored. So we've got these plans. You know, they they might be a lovely set of words, but how do we know that actually they're being implemented and they're making a difference to people's experience and people's outcomes? Um, I just wanted to talk very quickly about the Health Education England program. So when I was in terms of future in mind, one of the things that one of the aims was to um, to upskill the workforce and that's really what this program is about. So it's a, a million pounds to encourage innovation in the development of mental health services to children and young people, including those with learning disabilities and or autism. So that money was um, was uh, given out um, in March um, for a program of work for the year ahead. Um, so again, we'll make sure that um, as soon as the, um, the, the the successful grant holders have not yet been announced, but as soon as they have been announced, we'll make sure that um, we let you know who they are in case you, you would be interested in following any of them up. So um, that's it in terms of the actual presentation. We just wanted to finish by making sure that you had my contact details and Jackie's contact details and um, and just wanted to leave some time at the end just to make sure that you if you had any questions we had an opportunity to answer them for you so you need to type them Okay, so um, looking at the questions that we've got um, initially, and just to say that we may not know the answers, um, and if we don't, then we, we will find somebody who does, and we will get back to you. So the first question is, is there any resource coming to CCGs to enable CTR to take place? At the moment, these are being added to our existing jobs. 
Jackie, I'm looking at you. Um, I know there is guidance about CTLs, but I presume this is a question about resource in terms of money and capacity. I think that's a really good question and one that we should um, conduct back to NHS England and ask uh, for an answer on that in response to the webinar. Okay, we will do that. Um, okay, oh, they're coming in thick and fast now. Um, oh, can we have a copy of your presentation, please? Yes, I'm looking at Luke now. Absolutely, you can. Um, and that's the next one as well. So, copy of the slides. Um, and would be good if we could see reviews of case studies. So, there is lots of information on the Paving the Way website, isn't there, Jackie? And, and the Paving the Way report has some excellent case studies in it. Do you just want to kind of say a bit more about that? Yes, um, so Paving the Way report um, was a, an initial look at the evidence about what works for this group of children and then some case studies of where that's being put into practice. As Amanda said, you can find it on the Paving the Way website. Um, we are looking to collect up further examples of best practice, so if people do have examples, you can get in touch with me um, and share those. Um, we have uh, plans to collect more and there's you know, the more we collect, we'll, the more we'll share. Um, and um, hopefully through the IPC work and the Transforming Care Fast Track Areas, um, you know, we will start to see some momentum um, with um, better examples of good practice that people can replicate. Okay, super. So, um, can you give us examples of which um, lo uh, local transformation plans have good detail about learning disability? So um, it was a colleague of mine who did that look through them. So I'll ask him um, and we'll make sure that, that, um, that we, I, mean, I, let, I must be honest, we haven't looked through them all, uh, but where we're aware of, um, of ones that have, um, have got good detail on, on learning disability, we'll come back to you on that. Is the IPC the same as continuing care? No. Um, so continuing care is guidance, it's not statutory, um, it, is, um, it, it is a process for meeting the needs of children whose health needs are so significant that they can't be met within um, within, if you like, block contracts or, you know, universal, um, universally available specialist services. So, um, I, I suppose where they're the same is that very often if you were looking at the kind of children who, who who might have a personal health budget, um, which is the which is where so integrated personal commissioning is around developing personal health budgets or personal budgets for children, young people, and adults, um, and ensuring that they have a person-centred care plan and a package that supports that. Essentially, you there would be a massive overlap between children who were eligible for children's continuing care and children who might be a focus of, of an IPC pilot and who would be looking at whether or not they would be eligible for personal health budget and whether that was the best way to meet their needs. Um, do CTRs replace EHC plans uh, for those children young people who have them? No. No, no. Um, uh, so all uh, education, health and care plans should be there for all children. If they are in hospital, um, we would want that education, health and care plan to be continued, but there are concerns that often is not the case. Um, our care and treatment review is specifically around where those children are at risk of admission um, or where they're already in a hospital setting, um, reviewing where they should be and then what their care should look like. But of course, um, that care and treatment review should take into account their education, health and care plan. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's it. Oh, no, we've got another one. Um, the funding reforms for schools, if agreed, will impact on our joint commissioning arrangements as it will effectively remove money given... Oh, hang on a minute. Why has that just appeared? Oh, there. Remove money given by the LA to the pool. They feel like it goes against joint commissioning arrangements. Yes. I mean, we were talking about this earlier on today. Um, the Special Education Consortium, uh, which is based um, at uh, Council for Disabled Children, has just written to ministers, um, essentially raised significant concerns. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, so um, the government is looking to reform um, funding for schools um, and the way that schools have, it's so 
the formula that is currently arrived at um, has been arrived at through a system of custom and practice, if you like. So there are, um, you might have two local authority areas with very similar numbers of, um, of children with special educational needs, but very different um, uh, grant funding from government to meet their needs through. Um, so the idea is to even that out, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but unfortunately they're talking about evening it out at the lower level rather than at the higher level. So that would mean that some local authority areas could lose a significant amount of money. So we have pointed that out to them and, and hope that they will reconsider that um, given the, you know, their desire to make the reforms work. And obviously um, that, that, that really would um, not help in terms of, of, of kind of joint working if, if, if one party at the table um, has to take their pot of money away. Um, okay, do you, oh, sorry in a minute, do you know of good written examples of local area policies to agree on the splits of funding for young people with challenging behaviours in residential placements? I'm looking at Jackie on this one. I'm just trying to understand the question about the splits of funding. I suppose it's, a, a, how, do we know of good processes where, that, that help local areas decide on, if, if you're looking at a placement for a a child uh, with behaviour that's a challenge in a residential school, who pays for what, if you like, how does that funding split down? Um, and we're certainly aware of some some good practice examples. I mean, I guess our concerns have been more about the early intervention stuff and, and how you prevent children, young people ending up in residential special schools. Um, but actually, as part of the joint commissioning focus that um, that we had when we were developing the learning modules um, for commissioners, we have looked at some some elements of good practice around that. Um, so I will I'll see what I can root out for that. Not at the top of my head, and I think the difficulty as well is that um, one of the commissioners that we've worked with most locally would kind of say that actually, it, kind of a formula goes against that kind of person centred kind of needs of the child. I know that possibly sounds like a slightly mealy mouthed answer, but if you are trying to start with with the child, what their aspirations are, what their needs are, and, and how you make sure that the two match up, then actually a kind of flat formula, you know, saying that, you know, 30% from this agency and 30% from that or whatever, actually doesn't, you know, takes away from that 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 beginning um, and then focus on the child. Um, but if, if we have found some examples where they've, they've made it work um, well in local areas, we'll, we'll certainly post that up for you. And I think the important principle in that is about everyone taking their responsibility. So, you know, the, the historic and very real current issue of people, uh, you know, this, this child should be funded by education or this child should be funded by health. Obviously, the principle of everyone um, pooling funds to support that child around their needs is what we'd, we'd love to see more good examples of that. But I don't have anything specific on that from the work that we've done. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you comment on the degree of behavioural difficulties likely to meet the criteria for continuing care as it's rather difficult to assess and a bit subjective? I mean, the, there is the diagnostic tool at the end, which I think does describe, at the end of the guidance, which does describe, I would say, reasonably clearly the kind of level of, of of need which you would be expecting to see if that young person was was eligible um, and I guess if, if you know if you're still having difficulties in terms of making that assessment you know it's what some local areas have found really helpful is you know to is to be looking with other areas at what they're doing and how they're making those assessments because it is a, you know it is a judgment call so actually sort of having some sort of quality assurance process where you're you know where you're running your decisions by you know a, you know a trusted colleague in another in another area um, who can kind of you know you know w w you know what trusted colleague I've said it um, you know where you can actually get a, a second opinion really on, on whether or not you're making the right call. And it's interesting, um, was in a CCG recently where they, where they were reviewing their 
approach to children's continuing care, partly on the back of the guidance. And what they were going to do is actually they've, they've realised that in comparison to the local areas, they're issuing a much smaller number of children's continuing care plans, but have been funding them at a, a kind of really gold standard. So they were going to, to, to change that approach and actually look at funding more children, young people, but a, a, a slightly less kind of, you know, all-encompassing level. Um, and certainly sometimes, you know, when you talk to families, you know, the, the, you know care isn't always thought through in terms of how intrusive um, it can be in terms of family life. So I think that's, you know, that's where they're coming from, kind of looking at more of a, a partnership approach with families. I mean, genuinely partnership, not just passing the work back. But <laughs> um, Okay, um, in order to be able to plan for CTRs, we need better data about who is in placements from the NH oh, from NHSE specialist commissioning, which we really struggle to get accurately, accurately and with sufficient detail. Do you want to say something about that, Jackie? I, com I completely agree. I think um, one of the really big issues um, with understanding the situation of this group and children and people is there's a real lack of clear data both at local level and a national level and it's something that we um, uh, raise regularly um, and again it, you know it's it's helpful to kind of do, to hear that other people agree with that and I think we we have to keep making that point because mm. it's fundamental um, to strategic planning to provision to funding and obviously to the outcomes of those children to know who they are and where they are um, and the data does need to be more rigorous mm. and needs to be improved mm. and I think the only other thing to say really is that you know we do have you know an opportunity as I said right at the beginning you know it's an unfortunate it's unfortunate why we have an opportunity but you know the the high profile nature of the, the cases that have been in the news recently um, and the ministerial interest means that we do have an opportunity to to really be putting these tricky questions and actually possibly getting some movement on them as opposed to just sending them out into the ether so um, you know so we you know, and we do regularly sort of um, both organizations but CDC if you're not signed up to the CC, CDC digest do sign up to it so we do regularly send out updates in terms of you know of programs of work that we've been involved in and um, on what's happened to them so um, sorry not to have a better answer for you on that but but we we, we will keep pushing on it um, how can we decide on the level of learning difficulty that's that means a young person requires a CTR. I mean, that's less about the level of learning disability and more about whether or not there's a danger that they might go into an assessment and treatment unit. Yeah, um, this it's. Uh, I think it's a really good question, and some local areas have done some good work around this, um, particularly in Bristol and Ealing, which you can find examples of on the Paving the Way website. Done some good work on ide identifying those children at risk of out of area placements and the support that needs to be provided to them. Um, and there was also. Um, a focus on this uh, a recent um, challenging behavior foundation national strategy group where we bring a national experts together there was a workshop in this and we're pursuing the issue with NHS England um, because there's a commitment in building the right support to something that's being currently called a dynamic risk register um, which would be a way to record those people at risk of admission um, but there's more to do to establish um, a good way of doing that that's consistent across all areas. So some work done in local areas, nothing national as yet, um, but something that um, is ongoing and which I think they're planning to have a, a day on soon to kind of plan that out further and build on the research that's been done by the Tizard Centre and others about risk factors. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis though, I think local services um, like in Bristol and Ealing in Gloucestershire where they have a challenging behaviour strategy across the age range has been very pragmatic in terms of professionals knowing who is likely to fall into that category and working with families it's, it's not a very scientific approach at the moment and I think there will be more criteria developed as the program goes on. Okay all right well, we've got I think time for the last question uh, which was uh, delayed discharges from tier four uh, beds would seem to be a big issue my experience is that social care can be reluctant to support the discharge due to financial constraints and does anyone else experience this um, and I guess we would say that yes that 
I mean, not necessarily, I think, where children are concerned, it's, I, I think, it's more like, or, or more often the case, that it's around being able to find a placement. So children will often have come from a residential special school, they may, may well have been excluded, um, which has led to their um, entry into an assessment and treatment unit. And if they've been excluded from more than one special school, then the um, the ability, you know, the, the likelihood of finding another special school to take them obviously diminishes. Um, so it's about, you know, helping people to think creatively about community solutions in those situations. And again, hopefully that, you know, the focus that we've currently got will, will enable us to, to really push um, government to make sure that these programs are doing that um, so that we're not in a situation where you know, because they're, and I, I think the other thing that, you know, that makes us really cross um, is that, you know, that what happens for these children is that, you know, is that they get a assessed on their behaviour at times of crisis when they're in situations which would terrify any person where they've lost all control over their living environment, they're away from family and friends and, you know, and people wonder why they behave badly. Um, I would behave badly. Um, you know, so, you know, so we really need people to be thinking, you know, much more creatively and thinking about, you know, what, what would they want for their own child um, and how do they make that happen locally and you can rely on us to keep pushing for that. And we've supported a number of families who've, um, whose relative um, leaving an assessment and treatment unit and going into a community setting, challenging behaviours have decreased dramatically and quality of life has improved dramatically um, and that can be done and under the Children and Families Act, local commissioners have the responsibility to be delivering that local support so it's really important um, that they take on that responsibility. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for listening if you're still there.